collaborations or networking, but there's a network here that existed. And I think it's worth saying just, you know, because I'm an alumni and everything, I want you to be successful, it's like, you, you know, present lab members are future potential collaborators, certainly future colleagues. And so uh, lean into those relationships. If you can create positive relationships now, who knows? I mean, this, these people are kind of all over the world. Denmark, Taiwan, Martha Smith here at Tennessee Valley Authority in Dayton. This is a kind of a national network that we had no idea. We weren't good at soccer, but uh, we were pretty good at training. <laughs> There's other people there who are family and friends of mine. So anyway, uh, here's what this, the seminar is going to be. Uh, I'm going to have a little bit of a, an introduction. Then I'm going to talk about some, uh, and this is just snapshot of research I've been involved in in the last decade. This is all these sort of post-UK when I went back to the University of Dayton. Uh, three major projects. Most of my time is going to be spent here, uh, and then we'll talk about, this is temperate, and we'll talk about some work in Taiwan, and we'll talk about the Arctic. And so the title comes, this is the title of the talk, and it comes from this quote. It's a famous quote from Otto Leopold. When I first got started in forestry, I was really taken by this early conservation, and this concept, this early conservationist, and this, this idea is a really interesting one, to keep every cog and wheel as a first precaution of intelligent tinkering and uh, it, it evokes this notion of, of wheels and, and machinery. Uh, that's, that's what uh, you're pointing to, the idea that if you're working on a clock or something in those days and you, you left out a car or a wheel, it's not going to work in the future. Uh, but he wasn't talking about uh, machines. He was talking about ecosystems. He was talking about species and ecosystems, actually. And this, that quote, which is kind of a, a folksy uh, way of putting things, which Otto Leopold did, actually makes a really strong claim, uh, an exciting claim about how ecosystems work. The idea that every species is important. And in fact, this sort of um, presages or uh, points to this, this area of research now called uh, biodiversity and ecosystem function paradigm, or biodef research, which is a huge and very deep pool uh, that a lot of people are working in. I can't dive into that now with sort of you know, uh, concepts and, and arguments in that field. But I will just say, as a background to my talk, a lot of the work I've done is, is looking at the linkage between biodiversity uh, and ecosystem function. And the rapidly changing planet part of the, of the uh, title, uh, I'm going to focus on two sort of global change processes. One's ecological invasion, uh, and the other is climate change. Those are sort of backdrops to, this, to, the, to the research I've done over the last decade, let's say. So that's the end of the uh, so invasive species, uh, this is uh, the, the first step down this path. Uh, invasive species cause human or economic harm, and they're an important threat to biodiversity. This is a definition. Invasive species cause human or economic harm. A lot of, um, uh, some, sometimes we get mixed up between the word exotic and invasive, but invasive species have a harm uh, element to it. This is uh, Asian carp leaping uh, in a stream. And this, is a, this, pr this creates this really interesting question. They don't act like this in their native in their native habitats. So there's 90 or 95% or of the biomass is taken up by that species. Uh, and these things are right at the edge of the Great Lakes. If this gets into the Great Lakes, the fisheries there are in trouble. With the capital T underlined twice. Uh, why? How, why do they form such high density uh, uh, populations here but not in their native range? 
and what are the impacts uh, on ecosystems? This is just an example of species. So invasion ecology uh, allows us to think about a whole bunch of different questions across a sort of scale of observation from biochemical to landscape kind of questions. We can think about what the features are that enable a species to become invasive, what determines the invasibility of habitats, what impacts do they have. Uh, I can't give you, I've been working kind of in all of those areas in different, different ways. I can't give you all of it today. Again, this is going to be sort of a synopsis of some of the work I've done. Uh, I'm going to start out, though, here talking about impacts of invasive species uh, on diversity and ecosystem processes. And the species I'm going to focus on is this one, uh, Amber Honeysuckle, which is com obviously common here. Probably if we went outside, we could find it on a crack, crack against the building. I would be shocked if we went around this building and didn't find it. It's here for sure. Uh, this is a um, species that was originally from Asia, introduced in 1896. Uh, it's become, in, in, at least in this area, in Kentucky and in Ohio, it's become an incredibly important, you almost can't do research in forest without dealing with this plant. It's in the background of every field picture anyone ever took, kind of, in, in, um, at least in my, where I live in Ohio. This, this plant is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And when I was here as a postdoc, we started a bunch of projects on, on amber honeysuckle and thinking about forest and how it impacts uh, species and how it's, um, we, we had a, worked with a student who was looking at different forests and the, the characteristics of the forest. Uh, we're thinking about decomposition and, and um, uh, insect impacts. And so I was really uh, focused on it from a forest invader kind of perspective. And when I went to the University of Dayton, the notion there, part of the notion of their process, whether this is good or, or not, is a, is a separate question, but it's, you've got to start something new. You can't bring your postdoc work here. Uh, and so that was kind of an impetus to me to think about and, uh, the species in a different way because I was on this, had this great momentum. Uh, and one thing I noticed, this is one of the uh, most important people who have worked in my lab over the years, uh, a guy named Eric Forth, and he's standing in a stream, and above the stream is a, is a canopy of amber honeysuckle. And it, it sort of sparked me, uh, just this, this sort of pattern in nature, it sparked me thinking about uh, how the species might impact aquatic biology. So that's what we're going to focus on. This is just some images from, from streams in Dayton, Ohio, or around Dayton, Ohio, Montgomery County. Uh, probably you see the same thing here in Fayette County and other parts of Kentucky where you've got a headwater stream, relatively small stream, we can almost leap across this, uh, an overarching, forming almost a cave, and even dangling into the water is, is in the middle. It's quite intense. In the spring, you've got this deposition of these flowers, that was really fascinating to me, what's going on with the flowers in the stream. In the fall, you've got uh, fo fall foliage deposition. And we knew from the work I did here as a, as a postdoc that this foliage is toxic to s at least some terrestrial insects. The insect eats, it was gypsy moth we were working with, eats the, the honeysuckle leaf and their stomach blows up. I mean, it's not good for, <laughs> for you. And that, that insect can eat almost any other species. So there's definitely some sort of toxic uh, toxicity going on. So what happens when that hits the aquatic system. Uh, and fruit, we're thinking about this too. There's a, there's a very heavy deposition of fruit into the aquatic systems. And again, especially headwater streams, smaller streams. Uh, what could this mean for the biology? And again, just an image of the, so you get a, a sense of the scale of this, or this is all honeysuckle biomass over the stream. So this is this exotic invasive species. No native plant does that. We don't have any, there's no, in that region anyway, your witch hazel or pawpaw or something does not create any kind of architecture like this. This is quite unique physiognomy. Uh, and so, based on this sort of field observations uh, and uh, just being in a, a stream of sort of scientific momentum, thinking about the species, uh, we launched this project. Here's the basic, and I drew this before we did any work, I think. Uh, here's the basic <coughs> concept. Uh, we have terrestrial inputs, especially in autumn, coming from the, from the uh, adjacent riparian habitat. This normally should serve as an energy or nutrient or habitat substrate, which is a basal resource for aquatic organisms. And so this ecological invasion of the terrestrial habitat could drive bottom-up regulation. That's an ecological term. But the big point is that it could change the food web, the aquatic food web. And good news, I didn't know this at the time, but I had a collaborator at the University of Dayton, a new hire there who's since left, named Eric Binbo, who, who knew the macro invertebrates. But good news, the aquatic folks have been working for quite a while thinking about these, uh, th these um, aquatic macroinvertebrates and putting them into functional feeding groups. So this is kind of the job they do if you don't know these organisms. They have different jobs in the stream. 
And so you can think about how this food web and the structure of these functional feeding groups could be altered by this ecological invasion. That was kind of the, the notion I had when we started the project. And so I recruited this student named Rachel, uh, and she's presently a assistant professor at Cal State University, Bakersfield. Yay, that's great, worked out. Uh, for her, so good job, Rachel. Uh, she was awesome, though, and she actually came from a from an undergraduate institution where she had done a lot of research, and she had done a lot of aquatic research. She knew the macroinvertebrates walking in the door, which was awesome, uh, really super helpful, and she had a real drive for uh, aquatic aquatic ecology. And so we set up this experiment. This is sort of the first grad student experiment I had, and it sort of mirrored what I'd done here at UK. As a postdoc, we had a leaf pack experiment and a decomposition experiment with leaf packs like this. Uh, and we had leaf packs where there was invasive species, just amber honeysuckle, some native raxinus and uh, platinus, you know these probably, I can say just leave those there in this room, you know what these are. And then a mix between native and exotic, and we put them in uh, replicates in the stream like this. We did mash free dry mass to measure decomposition rates, picked them up, normal decomposition experiment. And then Rachel went through and counted the macro invertebrates and sorted them into functional feeders and asked the question, uh, are, do we see differences in colonization of the macro invertebrates and utilization uh, of these leaf packs? And I'll just say, stop right now for it to say, we should have kept using leaf packs. <laughs> this is a great design. I wish we, this was the only leaf pack experiment I did, but it was awesome. And this next thing is the first data slide a grad student ever gave to me. And I was like, this is not right. This is not fair. How can you? <laughs> Everything's right. This is like a stair step. Each of these days, step, 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 and everyone's got a different letter. And they've never since had a data slide like that show up. So that was very encouraging. I'm doing it right. Uh, the, good, the reason why it was trout, okay, so what this, what this figure says is this is ashery dry mass remaining. That's how much is remaining in the leaf packs. And here's different days, days 7, 14, 43, 53. And this is the invasive leaf packs. And here's the native and here's the mix. And there's this perfect stair step between them. This is just saying that the honeysuckle leaf decomposition is very rapid in the streams. Now, we've seen that in terrestrial environments, so it wasn't a surprise. Probably a good project to start a student on, because we know we're going to probably get good results. I didn't expect it to be that thing. That was exciting uh, and gave me energy uh, to move down this path. Uh, and this is what it looked like when we did the functional feeding group analysis, or Rachel did. This is the leaf, this is the invasive species leaf packs. This is the leaf packs that are mixed. This is only natives. Uh, and these are the different uh, functional feeding groups. And what you can see is in the invasive leaf pack, we've got one functional feeding group dominating. In the native leaf pack, there's a mix, which made me go, oh, this may be some kind of mirroring of the biodiversity effect. You've got invasion of the terrestrial environment changing the functional feeding group pattern in the stream. That's really interesting. Functional, fat, function, <coughs> functional feeding groups were different. Spectrum gatherers were the significantly the dominant uh, group there. And so I thought, uh, this is going to be awesome. So I started chasing down this path uh, uh, to, to track it down more. This is, again, very encouraging. And the notion is there could be sort of mirroring the aquatic community could mirror the terrestrial community. When you have one species become dominant, it could change, it could drop dominance in the, in the uh, aquatic community. And so I wrote this proposal and, and, and it was rejected, rejected, and then su successful uh, for the National Science Foundation supported a, a big project. And I'm going to share with you uh, uh, a lot from that um, from that project today. Rachel was still there uh, at that time when we got the we got the grant, so she went on to an RA. And the first thing we did was a honeysuckle removal experiment. <clears throat> so we went to a stream with a chainsaw and literally took all the honeysuckle out. And so in the removal reach, it looks like this. This is native trees uh, and some sky. In the honeysuckle reach, it looks like this. So you're just looking at that, you can see this is a lot different. This is a this is a substantial invasion we were dealing with there. And when we removed the honeysuckle, what we found is that the macroinvertebrates noticed. The density increased. So this is kind of messy data, but these are, are going to be messy. Uh, but this is, these points here are in the honeysuckle removal region. This is over 2010, 11, 12, so over many, many years of sampling and resampling these ripples. That was a really exciting result. And one reason this is exciting from a management perspective is that upstream from that was honeysuckle for miles. Downstream, honeysuckle for miles. This is 200 meters. Took the honeysuckle out. The macro said, this is great. So that was an interesting result. Uh, and now, the next thing I'm going to do is tell you more about this. this um, so that was, a, that was a big part when we launched the NSF 
uh, project. But the, the next thing we did was, and I can't explain all of this to you, but we set up this experiment that had this design. This was the field sampling design. I'm not going to go into it here. But I'm just going to share one thing from it. Uh, but basically, there were streams like this, and there were sampling of a whole bunch of different things around those streams. Uh, and it was set up in this kind of fashion. So you've got honeysuckle showing up uh, like that. It's the same round. And it actually looks like this, where you've got reference streams, moderate streams, and a heavy uh, a site where there was heavy invasion. This is somewhat arbitrary in the field, although I have data to suggest we were right about that. Uh, the invasion levels differ. There literally weren't honeysuckle here. By the way, just getting this set up was not easy. The streams there are, finding these reference streams was, was very hard. We, we, I actually hired two people full time for a whole summer to do nothing but look for streams. And we came up with two where there's no honeysuckle invasion because it's ubiquitous almost practically. Virtually. Uh, so it looks like this. You can't see the, the, the image is not that clear, but you saw the one with the snow over it. It's kind of, it's at least that heavy here. This is just a pile of amorite. So the image is not quite clear in the heavy, in the heavy stream. So uh, we had five streams arranged in, in, in invasion intensity in this fashion. Uh, I got to put the native canopy back on top of like this. Uh, and so it really looks like that. And I want to uh, quickly point to the person who was my postdoc at that time named Kevin Custer. He is an aquatic biologist uh, by training. He does a PhD in aquatic biology. So he, he was a person who helped uh, set up this, uh, the macroinvertebrate piece of what I'm about to show you. So we collected macroinvertebrates uh, from these. Kevin led the team and collected macroinvertebrates from these streams over the course of a year. And after that, there was lots of sorting, sorting, sorting. These are images from my lab. So uh, we're sorting. Uh, Macros, and this is the this is the cup, and there's the organism in that particular image. Uh, and here, what the data look like? We're just working on this now. This has been five years in the in the making. Uh, but good news, I've got a student named Michelle Little, who's a UD honor student. There she is. She's working on this right now. This is fresh uh, from the R console, uh, an image, and this is EPT taxes. So that's a, the percentage of microinvertebrates that are sensitive. Uh, again, if you don't know that, the, the main point is that in the heavy sites, uh, this is, okay, so this is the, these different um, treatments, what we call treatments, heavy, moderate, and reference. Uh, and we've got in color here, red, yellow, and green. And this, higher on this axis means you have more sensitive tax at present in the microbiome community. So we do have separation from the heavy from everyone else. These are sort of mixed together, and then this reference site uh, is separated again, separate by itself. So this is just further evidence that the macroinvertebrates know that amber honeysuckle is there. Not only do they know it's there, that we see, um, sig we see statistically significant differences in the community composition where, where more sensitive species are present in the reference. Uh, and in the, in the heavy site, we have less sensitive species dominating it. And Michelle's going to finish up and write this paper. It's going to be great. We also did, a, did uh, a couple things. Let me just go back to the slide for a second. Say, say this one other thing. So we've got pattern kind of. This is pattern. And then we did some, some stuff that was process. Uh, and what I'm going to, like, why? What's driving this? Why is it different? Uh, and one thing we did to, to figure out the process, going back to Eric Borth, uh, is we did some microcosm experiments. And so this is a, a data from his honors thesis where we did, you did a microcosm experiment with these little organisms, which are high allele. And we put them in cups, and then we, we basically fed them uh, honeysuckle tea, so they were living in honeysuckle tea. <clears throat> and the basic idea here, this is survivorship, is as you increase the, the dilution percent, the more uh, Lindisfer macchiatus and more honeysuckle, you increase the intensity uh, in that tea, we have more and more mortality, it goes down to none. Nobody lived. So in heavy leaf tea from amber honeysuckle, these, which are EPA uh, model taxa, they all died. And so we have some other um, data to support that from Eric's thesis as well. So this looks like toxicity. Uh, the leaves are toxic to these organisms when they hit the, uh, when they hit the stream, at least in a microcosm setting. And then Kevin did this really cool experiment where <clears throat> we actually had both microcosms in the lab and also these flow through rigs that he built, which are really cool. In, so they're in the stream now. And he actually collected macroinvertebrates, put them in there, in this flow through chamber, and, and uh, did a test using um, berries and flowers. And in both cases, we had the same sort of 
uh, uh, same sort of structure. So this is the amount of fruit in the cup. The mortality increases both in the lab uh, and in the field. So even in the flow through system. So the fruit and the flowers are at least creating a toxic situation. Now we haven't chased down the details, so I can't tell you what the, the chemical is. We did do some work to check to see if it was a solid oxygen issue, or maybe it's changing the chemistry. We don't have the, the, those answers uh, at this time, and I will never have those answers. But we do have this some at least suggestion that, that the pattern we saw in those uh, experiments is related to toxicity of the materials here in the stream. And so we came up with this, this thing, novel, we call them not, these novel terrestrial subsidies. And I know that these days it's, it would be novel for them not to be the word novel in a science paper. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I think this is interesting. I haven't been able to find time to chase it uh, in my life, but I think the idea is you have really strong cross habitat impacts. We have a species that's presenting to the, you know, across those habitat barriers presenting materials that are new and unique. So we don't know what, the, what exactly the, the compounds are uh, that might be driving this, but we do have a good suggestion that's, that there's toxicity here. Uh, so we have pretty good evidence now that uh, we've got this terrestrial inputs that are driving bottom-up regulation of the aquatic food web, at least in some, in, at least in some way. We don't have all the details fleshed out yet, but uh, we have these <coughs> evidence from uh, Leaf packs, I showed you evidence from leaf packs where we have uh, clear evidence of different functional feeding groups colonizing monistera uh, leaf packs. We have this restoration experiment where we take the honeysuckle out and suddenly the macroinvertebrate densities increase dramatically. I did not think that was going to happen, by the way. Rachel said, let's do this. I'm like, okay. And it worked. Uh, then we also have evidence that, that Michelle Little is working on right now, which is across a, a gradient of invasion intensity. The, the macroinvertebrate community is different. In terms of mechanism, what's causing it? Well, we have some evidence from our from our experiments that there's some toxicity related to the amber honeysuckle material itself. Uh, but we have a couple other things. These are this is sort of projects that are still to come. Uh, the first is we're interested in what I'm calling bottom-up effects in relationship to to aquatic biofilms. And so this is just an image. Uh, where honeysuckle has been removed, this is in Rachel's restoration experiment. Honeysuckle has been removed here. Honeysuckle is present there. The biofilm community is not the same. One of these is not like the other. Uh, we haven't chased this all the way down yet. I did have a marble experiment where we used marbles as a replicate on uh, these bags, and the raccoons threw them <laughs> through the bags everywhere. So we've got a little bit of a sample size problem. But the, the, the point is, macroinvertebrates can utilize this sort of. Um, uh, algal community, and that, that could be part of what's driving the, the differences. Uh, and the last piece, the last mechanism piece, still to come, is this work that uh, a grad student in my lab named Erin did. She finished up her master's. This is really interesting. So when I was there with a the chainsaw taking the honeysuckle out, wood was falling on, on me. And some of the wood was like black cherry. Why am I cutting honeysuckle and I'm hit, being hit by black cherry? Look, and their answer was because the black cherry was caught in the, in the branches. That physical structure was literally suspending uh, coarse woody debris and fine woody debris off the ground. And that was really puzzling. And is this a thing? Could this be real? And so this is Aaron in one of our reference, uh, reference sites right adjacent to the stream. You can't see the stream in this image. There's no honeysuckle here, and this piece of uh, coarse woody debris is on the ground in a, in a site where you have that this architecture, the woody debris is potentially caught in that, uh, in that architecture. So we've got a paper in review right now that suggests that amber honeysuckle is literally serving as a physical barrier. Now, why does that matter? It matters because uh, coarse woody debris is really important to how streams function, really important. Uh, it's a habitat uh, structure, structuring, it creates diversity, habitat heterogeneity, uh, nutrient dynamics, there's lots of reasons why coarse woody debris is important in streams. And if honeysuckle is actually suspending and holding a coarse woody debris, that's a really important mechanism that uh, we're trying to explore right now. So um, that's the last piece of that. Uh, and well, one, one last thing I want to say here is that um, probably this door is closing for me in my research career. This has been an awesome pathway, uh, but there's lots of stuff 
uh, still to do. And I'll also say, I, I can't, I don't think I can show it to you right, right here quickly yet. Maybe I could. Uh, we've actually posted all the data from this project, 100% of it in, in CSV file on a, a University of Dayton site. So anyone can access it uh, and run any kind of analysis if you're interested in it. Uh, you could, yeah, I won't show it to you. Maybe at the end I can show it if you're interested. Uh, and what I want to say here just briefly, uh, and this is going to um, take a little a little bit of a journey here. I want to say uh, thank you, because I've got more to talk to do here, but for this project, I want to say thanks to many undergraduate researchers. I have a, about 100 students who worked in my lab. I've got a PhD program, a master's student, but I'm talking about undergraduates only uh, over the years, and it's been super uh, fulfilling, and just to say, I was a, a, a drift as an undergrad here in Kentucky, uh, or um, if you can imagine, uh, a manifestation of a demolition derby in a student. That's what I was. <laughs> Before I found research, to be honest. I didn't know what this was all about. I had no interest. So I've tried to make that happen for these students. And it's worked. Uh, here's Meg Maloney. She's back in my lab now. She is not afraid of snakes. <laughs> not. She goes towards snakes. Um, this person, Ryan Reihardt, is actually now a PhD student with Chelsea Prater. Um, and, uh, Here's some other students. Here's Amy who became an ophthalmologist. Great, I need that. That's an important thing to do as well. A lot of these people have gone in to, to research uh, and some success. And um, including Grace John, who's now assistant professor at the University of Florida, which is awesome. She's done really well uh, in research. And um, Amy Kruska, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Smithsonian. All these students were involved in research in my lab. And again, I just want to repeat the point I made before, uh, which is, your classmates are your future future collaborators, colleagues. If you were in a, you know, the lab with Grace, now she's a professor somewhere, and it just it just worked out. Like that. So thanks to all these undergrads, and thanks. I mean, again, it launched my career was launched uh, because of undergraduate research, and so I, I do the best I can to, to make that possible for others. Hit forward, so to speak. Uh, okay, so that's the end of the uh, invasion uh, ecology piece. Um, the rest is going to be shorter, uh, but uh, <coughs> um, also hopefully exciting. So uh, the context for the next, we're shifting context here. Uh, the context for this next piece is climate change. So this is data from uh, NASA.gov. Uh, this goes back 650,000 years. Here's atmospheric CO2 at 300. Uh, and this is a little bit, these, these data are a little bit old. We're north of 400 now. It's 406 or something like that. There's been variation up and down, but not crossing this line until you hit the Industrial Revolution. This is, this is very clear. This is very clear. Uh, this drives um, global warming. And so this is an image, again, this is from what used to be called the climate time machine, which is probably defunct now. Uh, but it was a um, really interesting portal from 1884 to 2014. If you see red on this or dark red, that means warmer over that time period. If you see blue, that means cooler. Uh, and what that drives, of course, is things like this. This is uh, from the climate time machine from Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, this is where the ice was before. This is where it is now. Some of that ice is coming off of uh, sea ice. Well, that doesn't change sea level. But if it comes off of the land, that's terrestrial ice. It's melting. It does change sea level. That looks like this. And I just want to stop to say that these people, this is, this is a jet propulsion lab at NASA. This is not the patchouli seance, okay? These are math people. <laughs> They're math people. The, the, this true story, these same people took a bobcat and put a physical chemistry lab on it and made it to a robot and surrounded it with parachutes and stuff and landed that on Mars and then drove that thing around for like 10 years. Okay, they can definitely measure this ice. It's not a thing. It's not a question. If those people are like, hey, this ice is melting, you just go, all right, all right. <laughs> it's definitely melting. You can for sure, if you can land that bobcat on Mars, you can measure that ice. That's not a thing. And, it, what, the, and what happens is that ice melts. This is the same jet propulsion people. If it, the math people say, if all of this terrestrial, not the sea ice, the terrestrial ice melts, it could drive sea level change of this degree. That's six meters. So Miami is now sub below the surface of the ocean. That means environmental refugees. We're not ready for this. Uh, 
So this is the context of the rest of what I'm going to say. Uh, so this is a forestry department, so I don't have to talk about this part. Some places I have to talk about this in some length. The CO2 are captured by stomates, are stored in wood. That's a long-term storage pool. Uh, it's sometimes it's plowed into the forest floor. That becomes a much longer term storage pool. And forests play a really important role in the, in the total uh, atmospheric <coughs> um, uh, carbon cycle. So up to 30% of atmosphere uh, emissions are uh, sucked up and, and held by forests. So it's really important to think about what are the drivers of carbon storage in forests. Uh, there's a whole lot of work on this. And the work that I've done is just a tiny piece of it, but it's interesting and I want to share with you. So we're going to head to Taiwan now. This is across the ocean, uh, far away. Uh, and you might not know this, but Taiwan actually looks like that. You might think of it as an industrial center, and it is. They've done really well. You know, manufacturing and so forth. But in the center of the island, it looks like this. There's not very many people. And there's a lot of really dense forest. And the work that we've uh, <coughs> done here has been funded by Smithsonian. Again, just a pause. That soccer picture with me and Jim in, I got this grant from working with him at a time when my life was important. It was important for me to get that grant, just to say. Future collaborators. And also the National Science Council, which was basically the NSF of uh, here, here are my uh, collaborators, main collaborators on this project. And this is the um, image of uh, Taiwan that you're probably not familiar with. There's a central mountain range. There are 160 mountains over 10,000 feet in elevation. This is big mountains, and a lot of them. It's quite impressive. Uh, and again, some of you know uh, Jim Nantri is at Dong Hai, his uh, office. It's very nice. The canvas is quite beautiful. He's done very well. Things are going great. This is the architecture of the building. There I am teaching. Uh, I, I taught a lecture. This is me. They're not used to Westerners speaking English. English. They had no idea what I was saying, which is, <laughs> which is normal. I, I normally feel that way in my classroom, so it's fine. <laughs> Just keep going. It's fine. <laughs> Frederick Clements. Anyway, <laughs> or whatever I was talking about. Here's uh, John Coltrane on wax and the image of, uh, of Taiwan, if you're not convinced yet. Here's their bullet train. That's awesome transportation. And if that doesn't convince you, here's Monkey Mama. <laughs> I took that picture driving. And this is a guardrail. This is not a zoo, OK? This is like a white-tailed deer in Kentucky. But it's a monkey with a baby. <laughs> if you got a monkey baby picture, you put it in. Uh, and the other great thing about Taiwan is they have this forest dynamics network. So there's actually seven plots. Uh, we only worked in three, Kushan, Luachu, and PTY. These are broadleaf evergreen forests where they've actually divided this up into 20, about 20 meter sections, tagged and measured every seedling down to one centimeter over and over again. It's a crazy effort and a, quite amazing. And the field station is very beautiful. I'm only going to say a couple things about it because we don't have enough time. But uh, there's a lot of carbon in these forests. This is above ground biomass. These are different models. We had to use the elementary equations to model it. And here's a bunch of sites from the US, like Hubbard Brooks, right here. Here's a site in Ohio. And some of these are Pacific Northwest sites, since these, some of these Taiwan forests are more, more biomass than, than our um, temperate evergreen uh, rainforest. The other thing about Taiwan is it gets slammed by typhoons a lot. Typhoons is the same thing as a hurricane. So this is an image of the trace from one of our papers, the trace of uh, ty uh, typhoons across uh, this part of the world. And you can see they come into Taiwan uh, and slam into the side of it regularly, and that has a big impact on the biodiversity of the forest, and this is biodiversity ecosystem function kind of questions. Uh, so I'm just going to show you one bit of data. Here are three sites. This site is a place where we get a, we get a lot of hurricane winds. Uh, these sites are up in the mountains, which are much protected. It's 10,000 feet in elevation, so it's, it's quite high. By the time the storm hits there, it's diminishing in its power. Uh, and so what we found there, one, one of the things, there's many projects, but one of the things we found is if you think about this as kind of a wind protection gradient, and you think of the species composition, uh, potential species composition, the species pool is somewhat similar, uh, that we see basically that there's some unused niche space down here that's being created by this wind disturbance. This is a role of environmental filtering potentially. We have much taller, this is height, sorry, this is tree height. So you have much taller trees in this site than in the other mm -hmm. site. This is probably because of frequent uh, typhoon disturbance, wind disturbance. And this creates this pattern, which we were just talking about at lunch. Uh, this is kind of interesting. 
Uh, this is from a paper we published a few, um, a few years ago. <clears throat> the blue points are central Taiwan. Uh, these points are from a site in China. This similar elevation is also subtropical forest. And there's something strange going on here. The strange thing is that in Taiwan, as we go up in elevation, the trees get taller. If you, if you, this is maximum tree height. If you've ever been on a hike in the mountains, this makes no sense. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> it can't be. Uh, and the only reason why we think that's true uh, is because of this tropical cyclone. And the tropical cy cyclones are disrupting, that is to say, these typhoons are disrupting the relationship between tree height uh, and species diversity. And then I'll just fit, finish this bit by saying, this is kind of the culmination of, a, of several years of work. I'm not doing any of this work anymore. I just wanted to show you a little bit of Jimin's thing. But we have this paper, and you can, I can give it to you if you want to. This is an Ophelogia. This is a project where we opened up a box, and there were many other boxes inside, kind of statistically. We're trying to think about functional composition and how it relates to um, uh, how functional composition is related to the ecosystem function in these forests. Again, I'm just leaving that there. But it's interesting. And for that, we'll say goodbye to the Taiwan Mountains. Uh, that was an awesome, awesome moment uh, in, my, in our research career. And then the last, the last piece here, we're heading to the Arctic. Let's see if this works now. <clears throat> so for this project, this is a drone image, actually of a uh, Laris Kajandrai forest in the Siberian Arctic. And what you see here actually is a line uh, that's a fire line. <clears throat> this is a forest on this side. This is recently burned on that side. These, these forests are super, super biologically uh, interesting uh, and also um, ecologically important. And we've spent uh, the last couple years working over there. And this is, as Mary mentioned, in collaboration with Heather Alexander, who did her doctorate here in forestry. Again, uh, this thing about networking, I would, there's no chance I would have been in Taiwan or Siberian Arctic if I didn't know these two people who I met in UK forestry and had just good relationships with. Not even like going, going bowling or something. I never went bowling with Heather Alexander. But we just had a good relationship. Uh, so she's done an absolutely amazing job of developing this project. She's been to Siberia, I think she said she's been, if you count the days on uh, Full year there in the last eight years. She's been working there and has a great project. It is far, far away. Uh, it's way up there uh, in, inside the Arctic Circle, this research site, which is right in the middle of this incredible transformation of the global climate. It's much, much warmer there, the transformation in comparison to where we are, for instance, in, in Kentucky. And the landscape is like un, unfathomable almost. These are these sort of glacial lakes. This is the landscape surrounding uh, the research uh, field station, which is right here on the Coloma River. It's kind of, it's, it is quite unfathomable, the scale uh, of what's going on there. <clears throat> so we're working on this thing called Yetima permafrost, which is 50 to 70 percent uh, ice. That's 20, there's 20 times more carbon in Yetima permafrost than there is in average mineral soils. There's a, excuse me, a lot of carbon in these soils. Uh, the total, this is crazy, the total carbon stored in this permafrost is estimated to be about double the current atmospheric carbon. And most uh, models indicate that this is going to become a, car a source of carbon in the future. As it gets warmer, the microbes are going to wake up, they're going to start processing that carbon, they're going to ex uh, respire into the atmosphere. The species we're working with there is called Cajander larch. It is the farthest, this species occurs farther north than any other tree. There's no other trees in the ecosystem. No other species. Only congenital larch. Uh, and this is a fire uh, <coughs> adapted species, or a fire responsive species, I should say. So fires, we know, release carbon in the atmosphere. They may also drive long-term uh, release of, of carbon stored in permafrost. So you have loss of vegetation cover, changes in albedo. This could accelerate warming of the soil. Uh, and large regeneration dynamics play an important role uh, in, in long-term um, climate warming. If you imagine a single species ecosystem across vast acreages where the is on top of Yetima permafrost, which is very, very rich with carbon, uh, what happens with that species? That one species matters a lot. It's, it's a lever. It's got a strong lever on the total, total global carbon budget. 
about half of the carbon in the region boreal, boreal forest is contained in marsh forest. So this is what it looks like there. Uh, and, and if you're like me, you're trained in the east, you're not about it because it's really hard to get. Here's the thing. The window for regeneration of congenital larch closes fast. It's only open for, we don't know for sure, we're working on that, three to five years, and then you've got to have a fire for it to start. Point number one. Point number two is the density stays the same after that. It can't regenerate, and there's no other trees. There's some, there's some crawling almonds and stuff, woody stuff. I'm not saying there's no other woody plants, but there's no other trees. And so this is not going to change. This doesn't go from this to this to this. Succession is not a thing here. There's no species succession because there's no other species. And there's no regeneration following it because the, the, the um, uh, environment is, ho is hostile to seedlings. They can't survive. So if you're a seed and you land there, after this fire has, has been gone for a few years, you die, you die, you can't make it. So it's really important to figure out what sets this. Because a high density stand is going to have a really different environment, maybe carbon pattern, carbon storage pattern, or, or, or dynamics, than a low density stand. And so that's kind of what we're after here. We're trying to figure out what sets that, sets that stage. And it's going to stay there uh, until a fire comes. So again, yeah, it's, it's hard, really hard to get if you're in the eastern forest and you're used to succession in old fields. Uh, it's not that. So biological legacies could dictate this, seed availability, shrub and moss colonization, and environmental factors. I should just stop to say, not much work's been done here. This is not like uh, Piedmont, North Carolina, where you've got ecologists under a rock. It's hard to get there. It's, it's super expensive. You have to know the people at the field station. The, you have to carry a slip of paper everywhere. I mean, it is complicated. It's not easy to do this research. Uh, and a lot is unknown. Basic stuff is unknown. So regeneration is initiated by dispersal into the immediate post-fire landscape from adjacent stands. So it's from here over to there. So we need to figure out what sets the, the density levels in the whole thing over the long term. So I've got two graduate students who spent time there, uh, Sarah Frankenberg uh, and Eric Borth. Uh, these are two awesome people. Uh, and they absolutely love being there. Eric volunteered this year to stay longer. <laughs> He's not just staying. I just lived there if you could, except the winter was negative 60. So it was pretty cold. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, we drew this. I can't go through it, but we started to map this out. This is literally a picture from a whiteboard where we're just, we're just like, let's try to map out what are the factors that drive large recruitment? Because this is what we're trying to figure out. There's vegetation cover, there's SOL, a soil organic layer, depth, there's fire severity that drives these things. Uh, we're at the very start of this project, so you're not going to get we're not going to get very deep here. Uh, and there's a big team of people working. It's not just me and, and Heather. There's six people or something on the grant. It's, a, it's a quite a large grant. So some very simple questions. Do high density stands produce more seeds for regeneration in adjacent post-fire landscapes? You might think so. This asks a question. So this is what this is Eric's thesis, which he just finished sending uh, some data from that. Uh, I'm working on the paper now. So uh, this is going to be a little bit hard for me to explain. I'll do my best. This is trees per hectare on this, on this uh, axis. This is cones per tree on that. And we used cones as a surrogate for sort of reproductive potential. We actually did take the cones back and count how many seeds were in them. And they were the same across the range. So it's a pretty good, pretty good estimate. So we can just count cones. And counting cones is not easy, but we did just count cones. So cones per tree and trees per hectare. As you increase the number of trees per hectare, the trees per cone goes down. Competition. Okay, what does that mean for reproductive potential? So here we have trees per hectare and cones per hectare. Okay, how many cones per hectare, not per tree? Uh, and we have this sort of pattern where as there's more trees, the number of cones increases up to some point and then levels off. This is probably a little overfitting. I don't like that line. Not like that, but uh, you get the idea. So there's this shape to it. So we have some, some notion that intermediate densities are probably places where the regeneration potential is the strongest. So if you wanted to go in the landscape and you go, here's a fire, if you're adjacent to a low density stand versus a high density stand versus an intermediate stand, the intermediate stand probably has the most regeneration potential. Uh, and then we did this thing, there's this hypothesis. This would be just too, too detailed for me to explain in, the, in this talk. But there's this thing called the safe site, safe, safe site hypothesis, which basically is in some, it, it's like this. This is how we talk about it. The floor is lava. If you're a kid and play the floor is lava, you've got to be on, only on the sofa and jump. 
maybe you didn't do that. <laughs> but the point is, <laughs> see, floor is lava. Seedlings can't live until it's too wet and too cold. So they jump onto things like tussocks. This is a seedling coming right out of a tussock. They need to be uplifted a little bit, or coarse woody debris, or against, a, a, against a, or there's a tip up, something like that. Then that there's a, and this is, we're just testing this. This is a hypothesis that regeneration of bark is dependent upon availability of safe sites uh, in, in the environment. So this is from Eric Morris, Masters. Uh, basically, I can't explain all of this, um, but I can give you the, the snapshot of it, which is this is a one-to-one -one line. Uh, if this is safe area, how much of the habitat is safe? This is how many of the seedlings are on a safe site. And so this line is, except for very low, when there's not much safe, safe area around, this is off, and the 95% confidence interval does not overlap the one-to-one -one line, suggesting, simply, that, these, that the safe site hypothesis does apply to layers could gender eye. They need safe sites uh, for regeneration. Well, I <laughs> really need Eric here to explain the safety cover. It's an exciting and interesting bit of calculus here. Uh, and then the last thing in my talk's over, just a few more slides, uh, is Sarah's working on this, this question about the relationship between environmental parameters and seedling performance. So seedlings, so maybe in that post-fire environment, the, the conditions of the soil uh, or the environment, um, local environment could drive seedling success. And so one thing she's asking about is fungal colonization and how does that relate to fire? And so I can't share anything with you because I don't want to step on her work and it's just getting done now. She's doing the data analysis. I'll just say there's definitely something mycorrhizal going on. <laughs> this is, that's a joke. There is definitely something mycorrhizal going on in pretty much every tree, but uh, we think there's an interesting mycorrhizal piece to this. We are doing some long-term patterns of stand establishment. We've got some really old trees and there's some fire history kind of stuff going on uh, with this as well, which is going to be fun and exciting. And so as the moon sets over the Siberian uh, landscape and my uh, talk comes to a close, I'll <laughs> only say uh, as a coda, just uh, what we've been working on for the last uh, 10 years, let's say, it's about 10 years now, <clears throat> is thinking about ways biodiversity and ecosystem function are linked and how those linkages are driven by global change processes. I tried to demonstrate to you that uh, this particular invasive species, amber honeysuckle, uh, is having cross-habitat effects. I've tried to um, demonstrate to you that uh, in this subtropical forest in Taiwan, we see uh, pretty clear evidence that the typhoon disturbance is driving patterns of diversity uh, and, and physiognomy across uh, the landscape. And we have some very, very preliminary uh, evidence from these uh, large forests of a relationship between uh, the environmental conditions, uh, the safe sites, uh, and the regeneration of uh, Larix congenderi, which could have very big impacts and implications for long-term carbon storage uh, in this ecosystem. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions you have. And if you have other um, things you'd like to learn about the lab, we're easy to find uh, at